my name is Jackie Linus. I am going to be one of our uh, panelists today and I'll be moderating. Um, we want to try and keep this informal and get questions going and have as much discussion as possible. So um, I'm going to do very short introductions, literally just our co my co-panelists names and let them do a quick introduction of themselves. Um, Tim Stenzel comes to us from the FDA. Uh, and let's see, Tim, are you here? You should be able to hear me and see me. I think we see it. Yes, we can see your ceiling. There we go. <laughs> um, Kay Taylor comes to us from BD. Hi, Kay. Um, and uh, Alan Wright from Roche. How do you do? Hi, how are you? And then uh, Lawrence Coyne from the FDA as well. Uh, are you here too? Let's see. Lots of great attendees. I don't see him yet, but I can't make it through all the pages. So, uh, so we'll we'll get started with the other folks. If you each want to take a moment to introduce yourselves, uh, I'll start with in the order um, that we're here. I guess I should introduce myself too. My name is Jackie Linus. I am an assistant professor of biomedical engineering here at Purdue University. I work on point of care diagnostics. We get widgets to the uh, proof of concept phase where we then hope to get them out the door via startups, licensing or collaborations with our industry partners. Um, and I have very much to learn about regulatory processes. So I'm excited to be here and uh, with this great panel. Tim, if you would like to go as well. Uh, sure. So Tim Stenzel, um, uh, I direct the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and Radiological Health at the FDA in the device center called CDRH. Uh, I've been there since uh, the middle of uh, 2018. Uh, our office consists of uh, 300, about 300 scientists. Uh, the uh, vast majority have advanced degrees, including PhDs uh, and MDs. Uh, and we review uh, essentially uh, the vast majority of the diagnostic uh, submissions uh, to the FDA. That includes both in vitro diagnostics, you know, laboratory tests. Uh, CBER does look at things that are related to blood products uh, and blood screening. Um, pretty much the rest of the in vitro diagnostics are reviewed by our office. Our office also um, uh, look, uh, looks at all diagnostic radiology mammography, um, as well as a therapeutic um, uh, radiation oncology. So um, a pretty broad diagnostic portfolio. Uh, we stay very busy. We, we see about 2,000 applications in a normal year. Um, now we're not in a normal year. We're, we're in a COVID year, <laughs> the first of this kind in, uh, in diagnostic history, I would say. Uh, we have now um, gotten several thousand uh, COVID applications on top of our usual uh, 2,000 a year applications. Uh, so we're uh, extremely busy. Um, it's been a, a, a challenge, um, but I think we've done a pretty good job overall. So I'll just explain kind of what the FDA does and how we uh, interact with test developers. So. Um, first of all, uh, we're very open to interactions with test developers, and we have, in, in normal times, we have something called a pre-submission or a Q-submission uh, program, um, and that allows uh, developers to come in with an idea, share it with us, discuss it with us, ask specific questions about their device, and get specific uh, um, guidance, uh, you know, responses on how, what, what the, you know, regulatory pathway would be, what the kind of studies that we would expect to see to support that application. Uh, so that's all uh, prior to an actual submission. Then, then we also receive submissions um, for, um, you know, for devices that could be 510Ks, de novos, and PMAs, and maybe if we have time, and that's important, we can go into those differences. And then we review those applications um, and 
then uh, once we authorize an application, then we continue to monitor those devices on market. So uh, we look for any reports of problems. Uh, if we see uh, anything that's confirmed that's, a, that's of importance, we may do a recall uh, with the with the uh, developer. Uh, but in all cases, we reach out to the developer where we have concerns and try to figure out what's going on. And then, uh, and so the EUA situation for COVID is different. It's a much lower bar to get a COVID application in through the FDA. Um, it's probably, um, if I were to estimate it, it's two orders of magnitude easier if you count the, uh, the paper that's required uh, for a submission. So COVID submissions can be as, uh, as few as, as 40 pa pages, um, but free text that's only about three pages um, versus uh, thousands of pages um, for a traditional kit um, submission. So a big difference, the amount of information we ask for is a lot less. That's all under the emergency use authorization legislation that allows us to, to lower the bar so that we can speed access to obviously life-saving technologies. So um, it's been very busy. I'll tell you a little bit my background. I'm a molecular pathologist. Um, I did all my medical training at Duke University and then joined the um, faculty there. Uh, and opened the molecular diagnostics lab at Duke and developed um, LDTs and also ran uh, FDA approved products. Then uh, after that uh, stint at, at Duke, I was about 20 years at Duke, I went into industry with four different companies, graded responsibilities for 15 years. And I, my last role was um, as chief operating officer for a global uh, molecular diagnostics company. Uh, and then uh, I was approached to join the FDA in the summer of 2018, or actually early 2018, and then joined in uh, summer of 2018. So thank you. Thank you. I am still working on muting and unmuting, but um, as I as I figure that out, please bear with me. Um, uh, next up is uh, Kay Taylor. If you can give us a little bit about your background and um, BD's work in the area. Absolutely. Tough act to follow, Dr. Stencil, or Tim, as I know you prefer to be called. Um, Kay Taylor, I am currently working with uh, BD, Becton Dickinson. Um, I am the VP of Regulatory Affairs for their life science segment. So it's all things that are, are IVDs. Um, we have other segments that are medical and interventional, which deal with more of the medical device. Um, started my career in the laboratory. I've been uh, trans then transferred into what was Beringer Mannheim with diabetes care products and coagulation products, and then moved in um, when acquired by Roche into centralized diagnostics. I've been working in the medical device world for 34 years and moved into regulatory uh, for 22 of those. Um, I've also uh, worked with other companies that have dealt with newborn screening and women's health and cancer, um, microbiology, um, and have had the, the privilege to, to be in R&D, some clinical, um, clinical affairs doing studies for both registration support as well as for medical adoption, uh, CLIA waivers, de novos, and, and things like that. So um, also have supported outside of the, the regulated products. Um, research use products that are used by for clinical research as well as academic um, labs as well as analyte specific reagents um, having uh, experience with those which are building blocks that laboratories can use to, to create their own laboratory developed test um, and so I have a, a pretty wide range and I'm happy to answer any questions today during the, the panel wonderful thank you so much um, yeah, I have many questions, <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to let everybody else ask them too. Um, Alan, uh, if you would like to go next, if my unmuting is working, there we yes, go. Yes, yes. So I'm Alan Wright. Uh, I'm with uh, Roche Diagnostics Corporation. I've been with Roche for eight years. I'm the chief scientific officer, and located right here in Indianapolis. And um, our group really is charged with the uh, post-launch support of products. So after our research and development group develops products and gets the initial approval, uh, we take it from there. However, um, as is everything with um, 
with uh, COVID. It seemed like we were almost in uh, daily communication, daily multifaceted communication with the uh, with the FDA at times, and uh, with different different tones. Uh, and uh, um, it, it really, uh, I think, in the end, has has brought us uh, brought us closer together. And uh, so, what? Um, what I think uh, this session will really touch on is um, the evolution of the uh, interaction of uh, FDA and industry. And I, I look forward to that discussion. Wonderful, thank you. And I saw that, um, Lawrence, you're on here as well. I just uh, can see, there we go. If you're able okay. to give a in little introduction as well, that would be fantastic. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm Larry Coyne. I've been with the Food and Drug Administration for over 30 years now. Um, my current position is the Director of the Division of Restorative and Repair in Trauma Devices within the Office of Orthopedic Devices. Uh, I do have to admit right off the bat that I'm uh, at a little bit of a disadvantage from the standpoint of um, talking about diagnostics and disease detection. Uh, we don't have any uh, devices within our within the particular review realm of my division and office that are cleared or, or approved. Uh, um, there are um, number of people have come up with innovative ideas that we've seen uh, pop up in the literature and discussed at conferences, but um, I, um, there's nothing within the public domain that I would be able to talk about um, from the standpoint of anything which has been cleared or, or approved by FDA. Uh, the what you are seeing in the literature and um, seeing the patents on are is the use of um, uh, um, uh, tech, uh, of a uh, in vivo um, <clears throat> uh, in vivo uh, parameter measurement that's actually intimately tied in with implanted uh, devices or what's known as a smart uh, technology that uh, provides like a, uh, for example, like um, uh, strain measurements during the bone healing process. Uh, those, there are uh, devices of that sort that have actually come onto the market, uh, um, which would be the, um, well, it, it doesn't represent like an, you know, an actual, uh, pre-diagnosis of, uh, of an orthopedic related disease condition. It, it's probably about the um, closest related uh, type of device that, I, I, that I'd be able to think of that's, that's actually has, um, has been uh, marketed and uh, has, uh, has been uh, <clears throat> received uh, clearance from FDA. But I, um, like everybody else, I look forward to a very interesting discussion. I, I'm very glad to be part of this group and uh, I'd be happy to entertain any uh, media questions that anyone might have. Very cool, thank you. Yeah, I think we're, we're definitely interested in everything from the earliest screening all the way through, you know, detection, confirmatory diagnostics, monitoring on, on how things are going. There's, um, I can see participants from all of that range. So it's wonderful to have you here. I'm, I'm gonna kick off the questions and, and ask uh, from my selfish view as an academic, we don't tend to reach out to the FDA. Should we be doing that? And, or, or should we be waiting until it gets to a, at least a startup phase or, um, yeah, what are we doing wrong? Well, I don't know that you're doing anything wrong. And we'll work with, uh, you know, startups, academics, 
uh, as well as the big guys, you know, and we, we treat everybody uh, you know, the same. There are advantages to small startup companies as far as the cost uh, of fees um, for an actual submission. One thing I, I, I mentioned earlier was the pre-sub or Q-sub program. It's on a, that program's a little bit on a, on a pause right now, I'll just say, except for um, a very isolated condition, which I'll, I'll discuss. Um, and, and that's just because of the overwhelming workload that we have right now. But the pre-sub, Q-sub submission process is free. It's free to everybody. So uh, it really, uh, there's no cost. If you want to find out, you know, are you heading in the right direction? If you want to think about what clinical studies might be needed, um, any of those things, you can put those into uh, basically a question format and send it to us in the under that program, and we'll we'll uh, you can request a meeting that uh, uh, either uh, well it used to be in person, but now it's by you know Zoom or WebEx or something, um, and we can answer that. Now I will say there is one uh, of the Q sub programs that we're still uh, very active in, and this um, this I think applies to an innovative group um, like this, and that is it's called the Breakthrough Program. Um, probably you've heard about the Breakthrough Program, and it's an important program. It was initiated by our center. Um, and it was meant to. Um, uh, uh, speed the the initial process of test development um, uh, by close interaction, uh, tight timelines with the FDA. Um, once somebody is designated a, as ha having a breakthrough device, and it not it applies not to just to IVDs or radiology, but also anything in the device center, it can apply to. Um, and if you apply through the breakthrough program now for designation. Um, we still are reviewing those, uh, and we're attempting to meet the established timeline, timelines for the review, which I think is about 30 days for the review to determine whether it's a breakthrough. Now, why it's so important is if your device achieves the breakthrough status, once you lost, launch that device, once you get authorized and launch that device, CMS uh, pretty much guarantees reimbursement for a period of time. Uh, and that's a very desirable thing to have, obviously. Um, you can look to the bright breakthrough um, guidance that we've published as to whether your device, your idea, your IVD, whatever, um, would apply under that program. So, um, yeah. Jacqueline? Yeah, absolutely. If, if I could comment on that too, I'm, I'm on a variety of uh, translational medicine committees with university. And I would recommend maybe not getting um, the FDA involved, but certainly regulatory scientists involved almost at the inception of the concept because the uh, intended use and the intended use statement uh, influences the regulatory path that is taken. And that in turn influences the development of the test or, or device. So, um, have the innovators state in a simple sentence what this will do, and that that actually drives the regulatory path and the um, design of the device. That is great advice. Thank you. Um, I, I also wanted to ask you and Kay, when at what stage do you all get involved um, from the big company side? Um, um. I'll go first, Alan. I'm sure it's probably very similar. Uh, most companies that we're, we're engaged, regulatory is engaged very early on um, in new product development. Just as Alan said, you know, that's almost my mantra, right? What is the intended use when uh, a new product is being developed? Because that leads us down the road of what analytical testing needs to be done, what clinical testing. Um, if it's a novel product FDA has never seen before, we're going to be more Inter you know, interactive with FDA to introduce them to that, to give them time to also um, learn about that new product and, and help us, you know, 
determine what is the most appropriate regulatory pathway. If there's not, if it's not um, eligible for um, a 510K, it may be something that is eligible to go through the de novo um, process, but there's a lot of engagement. One other tool that we've used for very simple things, we've used the, the, the Q submission process um, often. It is very, very great um, tool for companies to use, but also if there's a simple question you have, we've often used um, the division of industry and uh, consumer. So DICE, D-I-C-E, just to send down a simple question. Um, often they can answer something or give us the right direction for that. And it's a little less, um, you know, if it's a simple question, you don't you don't need to do the whole presa, but then when you've got your, your package ready for that, you can go that route. So intended use and indications for use are really important to get your teams thinking about or your 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 researchers thinking about what's that going to be and how is the clinician going to use that result or that outcome from that test? Yeah, actionable results. <laughs> Um, an illustration of an internal experiment. So our, uh, immuno, our immunoassay organization is European-based and our molecular organization is um, based in the United States. Traditionally in Europe, they had CE marks where the um, manufacturer could self-declare uh, the indication. And uh, a, a typical, that, that is changing now with the new um, in vitro diagnostic regulations in Europe. But traditionally um, in Europe, you could say, I am uh, developing a, um, oh, what's a, I don't, I don't know, a, um, a chorionic, um, a CEA assay to measure CEA. And that, that would be a European intended use. Uh, an American intended use would be uh, CEA to monitor, to aid in the diagnosis of uh, potential metastases or something like that. What would happen would th that is a much uh, more difficult regulatory path than the European path where they say the test measures a value. And we would develop in Europe and then try to export uh, those developed tests into the United States. And that incurs additional uh, regulatory burden as we develop that clinical indication in the United States. That is changing now. Uh, so one of the exercises we're doing now is trying to move our marketing and regulatory efforts earlier in our development stages because the, the biochemists used to develop things because they could, and now it's they develop things because they should. And uh, you know that, that is a cultural change for the immunoassays where the US-based molecular group, they, they already have that clinical utility um, ingrained in their development thought process. Um, so, so we're, at one point, we're, we're pretty good at developing a U.S. style indication, and the other part, we are we are learning. That's that's great to know that sort of the different cultural styles, even within um, even within single companies. We have our first question from the audience, and everyone else, if you would like to throw them into the chat, I am happy to ask them for you, or um, we can let you unmute, but. Ji and Kim asked, when does a test validation start to become human subjects research? Um, and then when does it also become a clinical trial uh, regulated by FDA? Like there's there's sort of different steps along the way. And can can we talk a little bit about that process? I can start. Uh, I'm sure uh, my colleagues on the phone will have some other thoughts too. Um, it really, your device should be locked down. That is, the design is locked down. You, you have a device that, that is ready to go into a clinical study. And, um, and you're ready to, to, to do a study that, that shows the FDA or other regulatory agencies that you have a device that is uh, safe and effective. Um, or the equivalent, say, uh, for a 510K. 
Um, so at that point, um, you'll want to approach your institutional review board and find out if they think the study would be um, a significant risk study or not. Um, if it is, if the local IRB thinks it's going to be a significant risk study, then you'll want to engage um, the FDA through the IDE, IDE process um, to um, to give uh, to, to determine if it is uh, by FDA standards and a significant risk study or not. If it is, then it would require an IDE to get started with the study. Um, the local IRB may want, depending on the study design, is they may want you to get consent. Uh, or not. It depends on whether you're, um, um, you know, going to be drawing a new sample just for um, the, the, the test, the candidate uh, device, uh, or you're doing something invasive, uh, beyond minimally invasive. So, uh, but if you're using residual samples and there's no need for consent, um, that may be, you know, implied. So, um, you know, we recommend you, you work with your local um, um, IRB uh, uh, to work through all those details. For for the FDA's point of view, what we want to see is a, a detailed um, uh, SOP, standard operating procedure, a procedure for the um, for the trial that lays out um, how it's going to be done, how how you're who's going to be included, who's going to be excluded, um, how you're going to collect the sample, um, you know how you're going to test the sample, what's the comparator device. Um, you know, all those things are laid out. And then you have preset conditions um, that will um, allow you to say the device meets your uh, design specs, your in design inputs. So these are design outputs. Do these design outputs meet the design inputs um, and um, that you required of the device? Um, and, you know, if all that is, is great, it all works out great, then you, then you write that up. Um, along with what's called line listings, you know, detailed line listings for every patient, all the information that's critical for an FDA review, and that's part of the FDA package to send in. So, it's, again, it's important to lock down your device. Once you start a clinical trial, it's very difficult um, to change a device. Uh, if you run into a safety problem, that's one of those things that the FDA does want you to make a change. If you you, it's at that point that you should check with the FDA and your IRB if there's any has been any risk or potential injuries. Um, but if you see a safety signal, and I've done this before in industry um, with a study, said, uh oh, um, we're seeing in that case we're seeing a false positive uh, risk, and we wanted to make a software alteration, and we didn't want to repeat the whole study, so um, we did engage with the FDA to find out um, if they would allow us to make that change based on safety. They wanted to make sure that it wouldn't change anything else, so doing a lot of analysis to do that. Um, but that that should be hopefully rare, um, and it wasn't like resetting the cutoff or anything like that. That would be a more of a challenge. So you want to go into the study, making sure that your cutoffs are correct, um, that the assay as designed um, is looking good in your um, in your preliminary studies, um, so that it's ready to go into the clinical trial, the clinical study. Thanks. Thank you. And, and I have a follow up. Um, one, do you need a clinical trial for the EUAs? Um, and, and then two, when you say lockdown, is that um, at scale at manufacturing? Is that prototype manufacturing levels to do these trials? Um, so um, it, it can. Um, you really don't want there to be any significant changes that could alter performance between the device that's going to use in the clinical study and what would be in production. Uh, there can be cosmetic changes like a user interface, some user interfaces, um, you know, form, you know, the outer shell of the device, you know, what it looks like, some of those things, you know, what color it is or whatever. There's some minor changes that shouldn't affect functionality or the, the interface with the user um, um, that you can then, you know, uh, make changes later. Uh, but again, it's probably good to have that discussion with the FDA and make sure that those um, uh, post-study uh, modifications won't impact, um, you know, their review of your device. Um, one thing is, at least in our office, we make a distinguish between a clinical study and a clinical trial. It may, uh, it's just how we internally talk about it. So, um, 
a clinical a trial might be something related to, say, a, a companion diagnostic. So you're going to use um, the diagnostic to select whether a patient in the trial gets the drug or not. Um, and you're looking at, um, you know, giving, you know, the test positive individuals, say, the drug, and then you're looking at outcomes. So that's sort of a, a full scale, you know, really involved clinical trial. Um, for a clinical study, it can simply, it can, you know, we allow um, uh, some banked samples to be used um, in the clinical study for COVID and also for um, non-COVID um, routine submissions. Um, but always check when you have base bank samples to make sure it's okay. There's no bias in the selection of those bank samples. But you don't have to go go out and directly interact with a um, with a patient. You know, in those cases, you probably get waiver of consent if the IRB uh, wants you to get a, a local IRB decision. So again, uh, it's an it's it's a scale issue and an involvement issue, whether it's a clinical study or a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. If if I could just, um, there was the other part of that was the difference between an EUA and a, a PMA, and I know that uh, well. So I'm, I don't want to speak for you, but the EUA we have to show that the the test is safe and presumably. Uh, effective in diagnoses, whereas the actual FDA submittal, we have to demonstrate that it actually does what it, we say it does. Um, if, if I could comment on that transition between um, uh, lockdown and FDA submittal, uh, most of, we, we see a lot of innovation and a lot of testing ideas and innovators uh, rarely are rigorous enough in their uh, evaluation of their proposed test prior to asking us to look at it. They'll, they'll often do an assessment of a test on a, uh, a sample set of convenience uh, and see a, see a positive signal and then call up Roche. And really what we'll immediately do is test it on another, on another uh, sample set or test it on another uh, specimen bank and see if it continues to uh, perform. Many times the assay doesn't perform when it is tested against that second sample set because of innate biases in the uh, sample of convenience uh, or the sample set of convenience. So an important thing to know uh, for innovators. To unmute. <laughs> it, it's really critical, and I think um, um, the the selection of the sample uh, that's being tested is. We've seen some failures in medical devices recently, as far as diagnosing hypoxia that works less well on um, darker skin. And I, I'm curious, how, where does that fall down? Is that the device innovators, the regulatory science, the regulation. Um, now, are you referring to the University of Michigan uh, letter to the editor in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine? Um, on the pulse ox yeah, New England Journal of Medicine on the pulse ox. Yeah, where there, there's a number of um, okay, so biased results. Here, here is my immediate reaction to that article. If, if you look at that article, they didn't specify which devices were used. Was that one device or multiple uh, devices? It was pretty clear that that was derived from an electronic medical record uh, analysis. And um, clearly, you know, we don't, we don't submit, I don't know, does BD have pulse oximeters? I don't, I don't think so, but you know, yeah, maybe in a different in one of the other the medical segment. Yeah, but if in the wearable side. But if but if I'm if I'm submitting pulse oximeters, there there are tons of scoring systems for skin pigmentation, and and I am sure the FDA looks at skin pigmentation. If if I'm a basic research, I'm going to look at skin pigmentation uh, for that. So uh, when I read that letter to the editor, I said, 
That doesn't make any sense at all. What are the other biases that they uncovered in their electronic medical record? I, I put my, you know, chief medical officer hat on trying to explain because, because all the pulse ox companies are going to have to explain this to everybody. Uh, and um, it, it didn't have enough detail in there. Like they, they didn't actually use the skin pigmentation scoring system. And it looked like it was people who identified as black rather than people who had dark skin that were included in the analysis. So, so that, that's my initial reaction to that was, okay, this, you know, if I was, if I had a pulse oximeter, I'd have to figure this out. I'm glad I don't. I would, I would add that, yes, absolutely. The FDA considers um, any transdermal um, uh, a light uh, sensing uh, a device uh, that uh, we would consider a skin tone uh, in the application. And also, when these kind of publications, especially high profile publications happen, anything, any publication, any sort of what we call a signal is published or uh, comes to our attention, um, you know, we look at we look at those things and we see if there's any basis for what's uh, being said in the article. Uh, we may reach out to the um, to the um, authors and have a discussion with them to find out what's going on. I mean, I certainly have done that like, you know, so many times during COVID, um, you know, when we see reports and publications that uh, that may imply that a test isn't working so well. Thank you. That's really great to know. And I, um, I think maybe sort of on I, the other half of my lab does wearables and, and I've seen a lot of consumer technologies that do particularly have these issues with skin tone and, and have looked at, you know, the actual t skin tone and not just the EMRs. And so it's, it's comforting to know that these are being considered by the medical device producers, by the FDA in the evaluation of the devices. Um, and that we're working yeah. a little harder than <laughs> than these consumer ones. Um, uh, well, that that gets to the whole uh, part of having a uh, an FDA approved device is the this is this is post launch surveillance, right? And and post launch surveillance takes many many forms. It's it's. Uh, scholarly articles, it's patient uh, complaints, can be casual conversations on um, on social social media. All of that is monitored for these types of complications. And I I want to you know change change directions a little bit towards um, I guess it's another smart technology. But Larry, you mentioned the the monitoring from you know, inside the body and then providing some of that information as healing is occurring. Can you talk about the challenges uh, involved in, in bringing in uh, a lot more of the smart tech side of things for FDA regulation and how it's uh, being dealt with? Uh, absolutely, and, and uh, we have taken full advantage as, as Tim has mentioned of uh, various uh, mechanisms for early interactions. This is a very uh, up and growing technology uh, and uh, it's really just ripe for um, early interactions with the agency. Uh, uh, and I, I would mention that, you know, from the standpoint of pre-submissions, we encourage them at, at, at any stage. Uh, we've had a within the Office of Orthopedic Devices, we had a, um, it, it, as Dr. Sharon was mentioning this morning, uh, it, I've had a tremendous growth in the terms of numbers of, of applications or, or numbers of requests for breakthrough device designation. So uh, with this per particular technology, uh, uh, which has um, generated a lot of interest in the activity, you're, uh, it's basically utilizing uh, uh, device uh, hardware, um, such as a, a bone plate and incorporating technology to provide you 
uh, real time uh, uh, stress and strain measurements, uh, for example, which are indicative of the and um, provide you a, a real time picture of the bone healing process. And uh, we've had uh, a wide variety of, um, a, if you scour the literature, you can see a, a wide variety of potential applications and different anatomic sites. Um, it's a, uh, we uh, in fact have had our, um, had a workshop uh, that we had, uh, um, that we had uh, organized uh, last year, and we look forward to additional ones uh, as well within the orthopedic uh, realm. Uh, we um, I would also mention that uh, it hasn't been mentioned at this point, but there's also an alternative to the breakthrough device designation program that's initiating next month for the uh, for uh, looking at uh, safer technologies, these would be for devices that are not don't uh, meet the criteria necessarily for breakthrough device designation, but uh, nonetheless, they <clears throat> uh, they uh, do uh, offer potential advantages in terms of enhancing the safety of the device. So. We are opening up that as well. The, uh, the, um, there are many uh, potential benefits that can be derived from this in terms of uh, expediting and increasing the uh, number of interactions, getting uh, quicker feedback. Uh, it is, uh, um, I should say it is a resource dependent upon the availability of staff and, and workload issues. And, uh, that they may be in uh, their particular workload at, uh, assigned at, the, um, at a given moment. But on the other hand, it, um, it has been utilized uh, very successfully and, uh, thus far. And uh, we have, we've already are, are seeing uh, devices which are where there's been uh, extensive uh, interaction uh, up front, which are um, going into the, the marketing stage. I, I, I have uh, submitted applications. I, I can't, of course, uh, talk about anything which is interim or not out in the, the public venue, but uh, nonetheless, that is uh, going on. Cool, and, and what's that program called? Uh, the, okay. Uh, let me provide you the, okay, it's, one moment, please, okay, uh, I want to make sure I get the, okay, so it's the Safer Technology Program for Medical Devices. There's uh, a guidance document that was issued in, in uh, uh, just last month in January, uh, and as I said, the, uh, the program is uh, scheduled to kick off in March. Um, it's a brief, in brief, it represents a alternative to the uh, breakthrough devices designation program. So it's uh, it may it's intended to include devices that are not eligible for the breakthrough devices program, uh, maybe due to the, uh, there might be a less serious nature for the disease or a condition being treated. And, but nonetheless, it offers in uh, um, some type of uh, innovation or improved safety. Uh, there are various criteria which are outlined in the, the guidance that everyone can access and may lead to a reduction in the number of adverse events or just as a known device failure mold. Uh, there are other criteria involved, but uh, we look forward to uh, um, utilizing this program in, a, in addition to the Breakthrough Devices Destination Program. That's Again, we, at all times, we encourage uh, early interactions, whether 
it's actually using one of the select programs or just uh, submitting a pre-submission. Sounds like overwhelmingly the answer is like get engaged and, and reach out sooner the better and stop stop you know being so worried on the academics and the and the startups and the early stage feeling like you have to have everything so perfect um i think that's yeah, at yeah, least I, I, at I, least I is just, one of one of those folks on that early stage <laughs> yeah i i would uh i would add to that in terms of early interactions you don't even need it um uh, you don't need to have generated any data, or even done any bench stop testing, even uh, conceivably just an, an idea uh, conceived on the back of, um, written down on the back of an envelope uh, would be sufficient to uh, start an early engagement with the agency. So uh, that's wonderful to hear. We, we have another audience question. Um, Tommy, if you. Let me see if I can ask you to unmute and then if you would like to ask your question. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you to the panelists uh, today. It's so nice to put a uh, face to the name uh, for Tim Stenso. I've been listening religiously to your town hall meetings and I thank you so much for, for your work there. My question relates to uh, molecular-based tests that we're developing here at the university that don't have a precedent technology. They're not necessarily a PCR-based test. They do function on recognizing genomic regions of, of, of the virus. For example, we're developing a SARS-CoV test, uh, CoV-2 test at the university with a company called Identify Sensors and uh, Dr. Linus is also developing her test too. And some of these don't really have a precedent, meaning a comparative technology that we can say, oh, it's like this one. Um, how do we deal with that in terms of for an FDA application? How do we, uh, what do we compare it to? And how do we validate the new tests using these new electrochemical sensing type technologies that we're developing? using our nanotechnology tools, for example? Sure. Well, if it's COVID related, um, you can send in, I talked about EUAs or emergency use authorizations. We have something that's called a pre-EUA. It's equivalent to a pre-submission or a Q-submission. Um, and and uh, send in you know, details of your device um, and how you propose to validate it and ask for our thoughts uh, on this uh, specific question. Um, it really, the, the devil's kind of in the details here. Um, one of the new technologies that I've talked about, for example, on the town hall call, and, and thank you for your kind words, um, it, are breath tests, uh, if you caught that discussion uh, one or two times. And, you know, th there, is, uh, there is no predicate for a breath test. So how do you uh, validate that? So um, it's taken some time, but now we have a complete set of um, uh, draft recommendations that we can share with breath test developers. Uh, in fact, we were on with RADx this morning and talking about um, this very specific thing. So it's really, um, it's going to depend on, on the, you know, what is the device? What does it do? What's the best way to validate it? Uh, in some way, you have to compare it to some reference uh, standard, some reference um, device, some reference test that you might develop. So either one that's already developed by somebody else or one that you develop yourself. It all depends on the specifics of the device. Um, and so, um, uh, we're very open to to these new technologies, obviously, and um, I look forward to engaging with you and anyone else who wants to engage us on 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 how to pursue an authorization and a study to show the validation. Hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, this this is kind of the story of diagnostic medicine, though, right? So we had culture and sensitivity was di displaced by molecular. Uh, there, there's a, a long tradition of how 
new technologies are evaluated and integrated by the by the FDA. So there's you know common common analytical techniques that they use. Yeah, and I know that, for example, the FDA has been quite uh, helpful in terms of providing panels for comparison for, mm -hmm. for example, the nasal pharyngeal test and so on, but yet we don't have anything still for saliva. And I know that you guys are working hard on that. And I do appreciate Dr. Wright's yes, comments uh, and thank you so much for uh, being part of this panel today. Uh, how do we deal with some of those? I mean, as long as we can take a good collegial uh, aspect or, or I guess an intellectual uh, perspective and attack these showing and demonstrating that the data is valid across these particular sample type, sample tests. Uh, so it, it sounds to me like we would have this conversation and trying to get uh, validation or at least uh, some feedback, understanding whether this is the right route to take with these right comparators. So one of our questions uh, that audience members had submitted before this started was, um, can, can you all comment on how COVID-19 has catalyzed changes in the regulatory framework and um, thinking about moving forward. I know Dr. Sharon in the keynote today talked about you know, more point of care, more at home testing. So both from the um, FDA side, how are you thinking about this? And on the um, industry side, how are you all thinking about this as you're developing new tests? Um, and then also is this, if doing these tests at home, is that more, it seems more logistically and potentially more expensive clinically as well to be able to even test if these are uh, good processes. So I'd love to know, sorry, this is like a multi-point question, <laughs> FDA side, industry side, uh, and then clinically, how, how is this changing uh, frameworks here? Well, we've seen a lot of innovation in COVID um, and a lot of focus on, um, on, on the home um, and, and non-traditional um, settings. Um, uh, for a number of reasons. One is access. Another is um, if, a, uh, if a patient, is, the, the first authorizations of a self-collected respiratory sample, you know, happened in, in, in COVID. Um, um, we've not authorized a, a home respiratory uh, uh, test before or uh, a self-collection of a respiratory sample. Uh, nor would we authorize saliva for a respiratory virus. So lots of innovative work. We've now authorized, I think the last count was 45 home uh, collection kits in both swabs and saliva. Uh, five of them are over the counter. Um, so no prescription needed. Um, and, and you see advertisements now fairly frequently um, of of the ability to get these these tests at, 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 at drug stores, at, at, at other stores, um, over the internet, uh, and that's fantastic. And then home tests. So we have, so far we've authorized um, I think three home tests, two antigen, um, and one uh, molecular test. So that was the first molecular home test uh, ever. So. Lots of robust um, uh, innovation here going on. Um, and I think this is just the beginning of, uh, of, of this kind of testing. Um, as far as cost goes, um, some of these home tests are going to be in the neighborhood of, of $5 uh, and over the counter eventually. Um, you know, at least for COVID. I mean, the price won't go, go up for other diseases, right? Um, um, but, you know, you name the disease that can be done at home and the FDA is going to be open to it and developers are going to go after it. And so I think it's all good. It's a very exciting time uh, for innovation. Uh, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And, and that's what's happened in this pandemic, which has been terrible 
Um, but it's been exciting to see the innovation that's been brought to bear uh, to deal with the pandemic. And, and then it opens up opportunities for everything else. So I think anything where patients can really benefit from um, managing uh, their disease or discovering disease at home is only going to help um, health care. Uh, it's going to promote health. Um, it's probably going to uh, most likely, you know, we'll like to see the studies, but it's going to improve health um, for everybody. So, yeah. And Kay, is BD pivoting in, in responses to this? I know they've put out uh, yeah. the COVID um, tests. Yeah, definitely um, on the manufacturer's side, um, it is change the way we we do products um the innovation uh you know typically a, a medical device product an iv a new ivd test can take anywhere from you know two to three years from the concept to, to finally getting through fda and a lot of these covid tests you know some of our earlier ones were, were in a matter of a, a couple of months or even weeks um and so it has changed how we look at what is possible um, it's obviously been driven by the combination with FDA also pivoting on how you know, how they're able to um, what the, the what the bars are right and I know they've dealt with having to, to change the bars and and react as well as the, the firms have so I think what has really um, you know has really kind of fostered that innovation is um, you know again I, I too I, I think every manufacturer has appreciated the town halls and um, being able to have that um, you know crazy availability to FDA and their current thinking that helps then the manufacturers adapt to what um, the current thought process is you know the the emergence of the very Experience. You know, everyone in the manufacturing world thought they had their on market um, COVID test on there. And now you've got to pivot and think about, you know, monitoring and keeping up with those those variants as they emerge. So we have adjusted just the the product development timeline, how we how we think about being more proactive in in in, in studies. Um, you know, the, the the number of samples you have to have clinically is lower for the EUAs, but eventually, you know, as we get on the other side of this pandemic and as we start to want to bring some of these tests to market as 510k products or de novo products or, or PMAs, whatever it may be, um, we need to have those samples because we hope with the vaccines we're going to get to a point where there's going to be less, less Less prevalence and that's going to make the studies a little bit more difficult but truly has changed the way manufacturers think about how to approach the different steps throughout the development process to the validation process what can you now do concurrently what can you take you know the, uh, still making sure that you still meet your inputs and your outputs but where can you now maybe be a little bit more um, risk uh, risk tolerant where you can do some of those studies before you know you don't want to do a study until you know the next study the, pre the predecessor study is done and so um, now we're learning with this we've got to you know we've got to do some things concurrently which has helped I think change the way we think about doing things as well. If, if I could comment on that development timeline that the two to three years is is actually brisk it can be four to five depending on on the type of, of study the other thing about COVID is that we're, we're kind of watching the sausage being made. Uh, we, we are submitting analytical evidence to um, uh, the, the FDA with the uh, promise that we will follow up with the clinical evidence as the clinical understanding of COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, unfolds. So, so when, when you, and, and I don't think, and, and to maybe, I don't think the FDA <laughs> intends to make this the order of business where you submit analytical utility and then, you know, wait, wait some time and then we'll decide the clinical uh, evidence. And in, in usual diseases, that entire package will, will need to be uh, submitted. And so, I would look to two to three years for, of development for FDA submission rather than this 42 days, 46 days before we get a, a molecular assay that can, that can measure, the, um, measure the virus, but we don't have clinical correlates quite yet. We're developing them and we're developing an understanding. So it, it's important to keep that in mind as, 
as uh, innovators develop uh, new assays. Yeah, and I would um, uh, add that some of the lessons that we've learned during um, the pandemic and interacting with um, a, a, a whole lot of new developers that they have, they have never interacted with the FDA before. So um, the templates that we've um, established for the various technologies in COVID, um, we, we've, we've certainly heard um, a lot of a positive feedback that it really guides their development and the validation. Um, and um, that's something that we can absolutely do um, um, for more common technology that has a tendency to democratize the access to understanding um, what the FDA is thinking rather than um, necessarily entirely counting on the advice of experts, which can be in short, short supply. Yes, you're still going to probably want in-house or external uh, regulatory experts to help you, but certainly it's, it's now with these templates, it's a lot easier to understand the thinking uh, around what um, the FDA is recommending for, for validation and, and what the bar is. Um, and so we can apply that to, to non-COVID work uh, as well. Uh, I think the other thing we've discovered is that um, more more conversations is is beneficial. So I don't think post COVID we'll still have a weekly town hall meeting, but um, you know maybe maybe we'll we'll see if there is a need to um, have some regular meeting, um, maybe once a month, um, uh, just for anybody who wants to to call in and. Um, uh, and ask their questions um, in an open, uh, live environment. Um, I'm open to it, so I'll have to run that by FDA and, and also see if there's a, a, a desire to have it. But um, I, I certainly think that a lot of developers have found that um, sort of um, sort of quick check-ins with the FDA very, very useful. Yeah, I love the idea of demystifying the process and. Actually, I'm using those templates in my class next semester around uh, point of care diagnostic development. And you know, now that we can actually see what it takes, we can we can look at the indications for use that our existing products have. But now we can look at like how is this thought of in the process. So I am, for one, I'm so excited to have those. Um, let's see. So audience members, speak up. Like I said, uh, like I mentioned in the chat, we have a captive panel. They want to hear your thoughts and they're here and can answer questions. I'll jump in for another question if that's okay. Yeah, uh, thanks Tommy. Tommy Source again, Assistant Director of the Purdue Institute of Information Immunology and Infectious Disease. Again, we I'm working with a lot of groups that are putting together different devices, different innovations, and a lot of them are combination type devices. So we do, we have a readout, but the readout is to a smart device. For example, we have a, a nano sensor, a biosensor, uh, that the readout is to a device um, so that the results are not necessarily having to be interpreted by the user. How do we deal with that? Is that a digital device? Is that a data-driven uh, regulatory approval that we would need as well as approval for the actual sensor itself? Are these two types of templates that we should be thinking about filling out? Um, so, so a device that uses uh, an app, um, you know, uh, for uh, doing various things, uh, our smartphone is certainly very timely and is already in use. Um, I think, again, um, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, when you're looking at doing things at home, um, when uh, you, can, you can provide everything from um, instructions to reading the test, to interpreting the test, and providing information about 
it's medically important information about those results uh, that you can then also, if uh, if um, authorized, uh, you know, if allowed with various HIPAA uh, constraints and other connection restraints, um, actually report the results of the test to uh, obviously to to your medical institution if that's how you set it up, but also during the pandemic to public health authorities, both local, state, um, and and national health authorities. So we can more easily track um, the course of the disease and whether disease uh, positivity rates are going up or down, um, you know, and, you know, so uh, these devices are, are going to be uh, are so helpful, not just in the pandemic, but uh, any sort of uh, patient interactions. Um, the, we have noticed that um, uh, depending on, on the test, on the device, um, that uh, smartphones can get different results, different smartphones, and even different models within a family can get different results um, from a test if it's reading the test, say a lateral flow device reading the lines on a test. Um, and and, and this, this could be for a myriad of reasons. You know, it could be um, resolution of the camera, um, settings um, that are in the phone, uh, it could be different sensitivities to light and color. Um, you know, it could be coding differences on these platforms. So the challenge will be uh, on the validation side. Um, well, um, you know, is, is how do you not just validate it for one device, uh, one specific model, one specific software package, but how do you make it sort of uh, a really open and how do you validate for many things, uh, including software upgrades and that? So that's where the cha one challenge is. Uh, the other, I think your question also touched on when is it a medical device and when is it not? Um, and that is a bit of a challenge right now. Um, I would say that um, um, anytime the device is needed for analyzing or interpreting, uh, reading the results or interpreting the results, um, then that it, it puts it into the device, medical device uh, arena. Um, and the validation of that and, and showing that validation to the regulatory authorities or in our case, the FDA, um, for uh, authorization along with the device is, is important. Well, I guess to clear, um Again, to follow up as an example, if, if you're just sending the data to your smartphone, that would then, the smartphone is then potentially not the device itself because it's not doing the interpretation or is that still a fuzzy area? So it's complex and, and, and it's probably good to check in with the FDA. For example, there are certain key alert functions um, that uh, it's important that it be accurate. Um, uh, I can give you a very specific example, and that is pediatric continuous glucose monitoring. Um, or it could be an invalid, somebody who can't, you know, really deal with uh, um, um, you know, a local um, um, uh, alert. Uh, they don't know what it means. They can't react to it, especially if it's low glucose and they may not be fully awake. Um, so, you know, a parent, say, in the next room uh, even uh, won't hear the, the local beep and you'll want to have a connection to the parent's uh, or the guardian's smartphone. Uh, and that's a, a medically critical function for the safety of, of that patient and that device. So it can be complicated, I'll just say. Maybe, maybe some of my colleagues can weigh in on this too, because I'm sure they're thinking about this and have thoughts about it too. Yeah, it's, it's certainly, um, it, it is, it is the next front. It, it's here with us now. Um, there, there's a lot of innovation um, 
uh, use, I mean, the cameras on some of these smartphones is, they're just phenomenal and you can use them for color, uh, calorimetric uh, uh, assays. But as, as Tim pointed out, there's, there's variation uh, among the devices and, and figuring out, understanding uh, what, what device is being used and how do you, how do you make sure that the, a particular um, device only interfaces with a, compa a compatible smartphone is, is, is a big deal. And uh, I, I think um, underappreciated uh, in general, in the, in the innovation community, I, I, we, we certainly in our development uh, uh, processes early on underappreciated the the complexity of uh, it's it's like what people do to diagnostics where they think all diagnostics are equal and you just go into the basement and make a diagnostic we we sort of assume the same thing about the telecommunications industry and uh, uh, it, there there's there's variation uh, in the telecommunications industry so it is it is something to be considered when when you are developing to be sure. And, and I think it also, to Alan's point, I think something you said earlier is then it's your, once you're on the market, it's the, the post-market continuing monitoring because, you know, the likes of Apple, Google, Samsung, they're, they're going to make software updates. They're going to change, um, make bug fixes. And, you know, you may not you know, have a relationship that they, they notify you of that. So you've got to be constantly have that rigor to monitor and make sure you, you're, you're looking at those things as a company to ensure that a model you validated on is continues to be a validated model that can be used with the, with the IVD or the, the other device. Yeah, that was my next follow-up was around the, the software updates and then also security concerns as we hear more and more about Hacking and so is, is that taken into safety account? Is that like where that falls? Cybersecurity is a routine review that we do even during COVID. Um, so, and it is a growing, uh, it is a very important topic. Um, I've, I believe I've signed warning letters about uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, issues. So we've had issues with, um, um, glucose systems where third parties could um, create a software app and hack into um, and hack into and allow modifications that aren't authorized by um, the original developer. And so, um, you know, we just want to make sure that any modification to a device, especially one as critical as glucose sensing, and especially if it's a closed system where the glucose monitoring is telling um, a automated pump to put in insulin uh, and uh, death can result uh, if it's done if, if um, and so um, you know we cybersecurity is is top of mind these days. On the on the insulin uh, detection and delivery side is that where does IVD um, d does your office work then with another office or does that all end up within the diagnostic side of things? Um, essentially everything related to glucose, diabetes, and, and insulin delivery now um, is, is within our office. It used to be shared um, with another office, um, but it, it was seen as ideal to um, uh, uh, to, to merge that into all into one office and one team. We have an entire branch that's dedicated to diabetes devices. So with, with some prodding, our audience has asked a few more questions. Uh, the first to come in, are there any special tips on developing diagnostics in support of predicting transplant prognosis? Um, is anybody working on that or have you seen that? Is, um, are there regulatory challenges uh, that we're not thinking of from other sides of things? Well, at least from the FDA side, we're, we're very open to this. Um, some of this may fall within the uh, biologics um, group uh, center, uh, CBER, say um, anything having to do with uh, transplant, um, uh, like HLA matching, things like that, or um, uh, anything having to do with uh, infectious disease testing uh, prior to a transplant. Um, but if it would... Um, 
um, be sort of prognostics. Uh, I'm not actually sure where that would fall between CBER and in in our office, but uh, I certainly we we would either be the primary or be um, uh, be a, a consultant uh, on on that submission. So. Um, if it's outside the standard CBER sort of technologies that I've discussed, HLA typing, uh, uh, ABO typing, uh, infectious disease testing prior to transplant, then, you know, uh, that's another opportunity for one of, one of these Q-sub, pre-sub uh, meetings to talk about the technology. Uh, a prognostic tests are usually lower risk because they're not making a decision that you um, are going to act on. So it's typically in the... Um, if it, it was a novel device, it would be a de novo and then uh, likely down classified to class two. Uh, and then subsequent devices uh, follow on would be uh, 510K. Yeah, and we have, we have FDA approved tests for BK virus and CMV for, for post-transplant follow-up uh, for, for those patients. Um, there, are, there are also a series of uh, molecular tests, they're probably CLIA and not FDA approved that um, are being used for, um, uh, for monitoring transplants right now. They were, they were actually uh, CMS approved, but not FDA approved uh, at one time, and I think they are now. But um, if, if it's a panel of molecular tests within an algorithm that scores uh, wouldn't wouldn't that be under your your purview, Tim? Yeah, no, I, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just um, there's so much going on in our office. Sometimes I don't know the <laughs> exact answer, and <laughs> I have to find out. So I never like to be definitive when I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know the limit of my knowledge, and I don't <laughs> try to go over it. <laughs> So then uh, Sarah Griffin asked a question. Uh, she's more familiar with the side of the IRB side of things. Um, Sarah, do you want to follow up more? It, it sounds like you might be. In and Sarah, sounds, Sarah sounds very young. <laughs> yeah, I apologize. I, I have my little one here, as I'm sure many of you do. Um, but I, thank you. And I, I apologize if this is kind of the wrong audience, but I'm more familiar with the IRB side of things. And we often receive questions from investigators who are kind of struggling with um, going through the FDA requirements. And so we often step in to help. And is there a pathway that you prefer um, to have like an HRPP office reach out to you? Or do you really just prefer for us to just defer to the investigator and have them reach out? Yeah, uh, can you go into you know some of the, the the questions that you you might have that you think the FDA could be helpful with? Because usually, uh, especially uh, university IRBs are, are pretty familiar with um, everything and, and know when um, to ask for FDA input and, and, and you know I'm not sure what you mean by tricky project. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, so typically when we would like run into issues is when an investigator, um, they know that they're pursuing a particular diagnostic device and that's very clear. But then when they also loop in another device as kind of a component of the project, but not, um, not necessarily the main aim, um, we run into a little bit of back and forth with how we would need to classify that device. And it's, it's often not something the investigator would necessarily be able to answer. So it, we just kind of hit a, a little bit of a stopping point sometimes with, um, it would be easier if we could go to the FDA to ask those questions. So I, you know, I'm just wondering about that pathway, if we just email or call, if that's an acceptable method. <laughs> Yeah, this probably would, would go to subject matter experts and, and DICE, as was mentioned um, before, may not be appropriate. So the Q-sub, pre-sub process is, is one where you can ask those questions in normal times. Like I said, that program's really challenged right now with our volume. Um, usually, it all comes down to um, risk. You know, is this, is it, is this have any patient risk? Um, involved or not. Um, um, if, uh, if it has to do with, 
you know, sort of, uh, what's the, uh, it's not a companion device. Uh, I forget that I'm blanking on the term now, but where you basically have two devices coming in at the same time and, you know, what's the regulatory uh, path for that? That's a regulatory question rather than an IRB or a human subjects protection question. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. And uh, family. We, um, we have another question from Nelda. Nelda, did you want to unmute and ask? Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Nelda Vasquez. I, uh, I'm a senior scientist at a company that was co-founded by Jackie. Um, we're uh, Omnibus Inc. and we're located in the Bay Area. Um, so with the, we are working on a, um, an assay for SARS-CoV-2 and we know that it's been kind of still undergoing the process and preparing for EUA submission. And with the current pandemic and the vaccines that have been authorized already um, and the ones that are being considered right now, um, do you foresee the EUA uh, process kind of being going away and having those that all have already been authorized go through the 510K, de novo or PMA uh, submission? Okay, there, there's a lot potentially to um, unpack there uh, and stay on because uh, I want to make sure that I completely answer the question that you intend, but there's maybe some uh, you know, things that I mentioned that you may not have been, um, been thinking about. So first, um, the EUA uh, emergency use authorization uh, goes into effect when there's an emergency um, declaration by the secretary of HHS. And um, we actually still have open emergencies like um, uh, Ebola and Zika are still open. They haven't been closed. As long as they're open, traditionally, I'm not saying all cases, the FDA would still be open um, to new e-ways, even when uh, similar devices have been, have gone through the, the regular authorization process in which in, for SARS devices, and diag uh, diagnostic and serology tests um, would be the de novo path that then uh, gets um, uh, down classified to class two with special controls. Um, uh, and so, but even, you know, even when we authorize that for grant that first de novo, that's probably unlikely that that one device can meet all of the country's needs for the pandemic or the foreseeable needs if there should be a resurgence in the pandemic. So it's highly unlikely that we would ask all the EUAs to convert uh, or to go through the normal authorization pathway. Um, the other thing is that um, the FDA is pre uh, the center is uh, preparing guidance um, uh, that will, be, will, will guide uh, through a transition period. That is when uh, when the emergency may come to an end, um, there will be uh, a gap, a time from when um, the expectation is that, that, that those that want to stay on the market uh, and want to pursue a 510K or de novo if they're the first one, um, will have time, reasonable time to make that conversion and get the authorization or at least the submission um, and so the FDA is going to lay that all out in a guidance that they're currently working on to guide developers through that. So that's all meant to say uh, developers, if they have uh, any way that we would review uh, on, uh, at this stage in the pandemic, uh, and those who already been uh, submitted and are, uh, or have been authorized, there, there's no... Uh, there should be no concern about whether they continue to market that product as long as it's, uh, it meets the bar for, um, you know, what we look for in an EUA device right now. You know, there, there could be devices that are greatly impacted by the variants. And we may ask, and uh, we may ask, in fact, we obviously have had those conversations already based on our safety communications around var variants. For um, manufacturers to consider um, altering their devices to make sure they continue uh, to be effective uh, for COVID. Um, the same thing is going for vaccines, right? You've heard already that uh, mRNA vaccine makers, most both of them have said that they're going to make um, updates to the vaccines based on the variants. So 
<laughs> that that fluidity, that flexibility, that ability to uh, manage the pandemic through the EY process will uh, will continue. Um, uh, then, uh, but there is the question of right now at this point in the pandemic, we've authorized over 330 tests. Um, and the nation's needs are different than they were in the beginning. The needs now are access. Access uh, is, you know, home collection, home testing, point of care testing, uh, and, um, and really high volume central lab testing, all uh, predicated on the need that we need to make testing easier, turnaround times faster, uh, in order to better manage um, the, the, the pandemic um, for right now. So, you know, if you have a device that you're developing that meets our current um, priorities, which I've just gone over, yeah. then, then I would encourage you to continue that process. If you wonder whether or not your device is going to meet a current priority, um, you can come in through the pre-EUA process um, give us details about your device and ask us if it would meet the current um, priorities for, for review for an e-way device. Hope that's all helpful. A lot of information yeah. there. I can also clarify anything. Yeah, we do have a uh, point of care device and then uh, we're hoping that it will then convert to an over-the-counter device. Oh yeah, so um, yeah, that's, that's um, likely to be a priority for a very, very long time, if not all the way through the, the pandemic. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have, Go ahead, Tommy. Yeah, I have a question uh, for Alan and Kay. Um, when we're developing devices from the university side, uh, we, we always have the question of how much de-risking do we need to do before we are attractive to Beckton Dickinson or Roche and be able to even call you guys and say, hey, we think we might have something here. Uh, what, when is the right time to talk to you guys? And, and when is the right step to take when that time arrives? Well, it depends on how much money you want to make. Uh, you know, when it comes to we, if it is a really great idea, uh, we would be interested very early in its developmental cycle. But, but typically, um, due to the business structure of of diagnostics, uh, we we like it relatively de-risked, and um, our last. A uh, few major acquisitions have either been on market or, um, you know, the the last, um, you know, uh, pivotal trial in it before it goes it goes on market. So um, uh, it's it's as 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 a matter of course it is more de-risk than say pharmaceuticals. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think as we, we look at companies, I mean, um, a lot of times it's it's those companies that are, are startups that are further down the road and have greater mm -hmm. de-risk. I think where the exception to that is, is where the technology is, or the, the methodology um, you know, the access to the market is a leapfrog and, and sets you apart from everything that else is out there, right? That's where that's where it uh, gets real competitive um, because if you have that hook, um, they're gonna be willing to sign it for more risk. I think one thing that, that Alan mentioned earlier that's really helpful is the rigor of what you are able to present to that that technology officer or that or that scientific officer is, um, you know, having that study that's reproducible, right, on a different sample set, um, you know, having a, you know, a good rigorous documentation of your development and those studies that you have done. So, um, you know, from the objectives, the methodology, the, you know, your samples you used, how many samples are they, you know, is there a statistically sound number there? All of those pieces is what we look at when we go in for a merger 
or acquisition is to see, you know, is the technology, does that help us fill an adjacent or, or, or fill out a, a market we're already in? Is it a leapfrog technology that's going to give us an edge over our competitors? And has that company got had the appropriate scientific rigor applied to what they're doing? Because then that helps us be more confident in taking that risk. And, and you know, our latest, um, acquisition failures uh, have been on the industrial side, not the scientific side. It is, it is scale up and manufacturing in, at that industrial scale. We can't have anything 3D printed. It has to be injected molded. You know, stuff, stuff like that um, often, often is, is overlooked by, by a lot of innovators. And so would you say, would you say then uh, that we should have at least the GMP manufacturers set up everything essentially done? Uh, I mean, it's, it sounds like a post EUA, post uh, 510K uh, type of, uh, of, a, of an no, approach. No, it's, it's not. I, I, we, we, don't, we don't need a plant built, but, yeah. but we need... We need a plan on how do we manufacture this at an industrial scale. So uh, we, uh, we have more than once, um, actually, you know, shame on us, uh, acquired technologies that were, were just too difficult to, to scale or, or when you try to scale them and you know, manufacture millions of them at a time or millions in a year. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. And that, that is a, um, a significant, that, that needs to almost be parallel to, um, to uh, the, the scientific and developmental effort. I mean, one of the things that they don't talk about in COVID was that IVD manufacturers we developed the manufacturing process, the scale-up process for our COVID molecular assay in parallel with the development of the assay rather than in a, in a sequential phase. Uh, so, so that's risk. And, uh, you know, we, we had batches fail, we had fits and starts, but, but that happened in parallel. So that, that is a, a very big deal, that manufacturing pathway. I appreciate that, Alan. Thank you so much because sure. it's yeah. it's always a juggling act for us here and <laughs> and to know you know how to stitch together. Let's say for for Dr. Linus, how to stitch together those two worlds of when do we get when do we do things and how do we ge how do we keep them organized in such a way that they stay in synchronicity so that we can be attractive to FDA but also start moving in FD in a direction that we're attractive to. Yeah. I mean, you have a breadboard, you have a breadboard and they say, we love it. Now do it a million times. Yes, exactly. <laughs> on the, on the academic side that COVID really hit us with like, all right, you want to scale? How are you going to make a million? And we're like, well, I yeah. have grad students and they assemble everything by hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's really shifted our thinking as well. Um, we, I would, I would love to continue this conversation, but it is 2.32 um, and we are supposed to be back in the main session where I get to report out a little bit on, and summarize this. So um, Alan, Kay, Tim, Larry, thank you so much. And to our audience and all of your engaged questions and listening, thank you. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you again over back in the main session. Thank you.